Hi everyone, welcome to Lay's Real Talk. I'm Lay. In my last video, I talked about the current status of Sino-US relations and how Xi Jinping is in need of a major external conflict to distract from his domestic crises. Using force to take over Taiwan might be his last chance to save the Chinese Communist Party. If he takes the gamble, the whole world will be impacted. So it's important to get a clear picture of China's relations with the rest of the world. First, let's look at China's relations with America's two most important allies in the Pacific. To Japan, the stability of the Taiwan Strait is strategically important. First, the distance between Taiwan and Yunaguni Island in Okinawa is only 110 kilometers, or 68 miles. Second, the Taiwan Strait is Japan's maritime lifeline for transporting oil from the Middle East. In the past, Japan didn't want to offend the CCP and had always played it safe in dealing with China. However, its China policy has recently shifted from being strategically vague to having strategic clarity. Over four months ago, on March 29th, Japan's Gigi News Agency reported that the Ministry of Defense began studying how to support the U.S. military during possible conflicts in the Taiwan Strait. On June 4th, July 8th, and July 13th, Japan gave a total of 3.34 million doses of the COVID vaccine to Taiwan, in spite of repeated opposition, protests, and threats from the CCP. We heard that Taiwan will not have a steady vaccine supply until July. Before that point, it will not have sufficient vaccines. Considering the relationship between Taiwan and Japan, we will have a good look at the details of providing Taiwan with vaccines. On July 5th, Japan's deputy prime minister said the country should defend Taiwan with the United States if the island is invaded. A week later, on July 11th, a Chinese military website released a sensational video claiming that if Japan intervenes when the CCP attacks Taiwan, the CCP would launch a nuclear attack on Japan until it surrenders. Please take a look. When we Taiwan, if Japan Two days later, on July 13th, the Japanese government issued the 2021 Defense White Paper. In it, the importance of the Taiwan Strait is officially stated for the first time. Also for the first time, sections in the paper about Taiwan matters are separate from the sections regarding mainland China. And interestingly enough, the paper's cover image changed from last year's flowers to a Japanese warrior hero this year. At the Tokyo Olympics, the attacks by Chinese nationalist trolls on Japanese athletes who won over Chinese athletes made news headlines, which further angered the Japanese. This and the Chinese military aggression in the region will likely shape Japan's China policy to be ever more hardline after the country's October elections. Like Japan's, Australia's long-term safety would depend on whether or not Taiwan can survive the CCP's attack. Australia's Lowy Institute released a poll in June showing that 93% of Aussies said that China's military actions in the Pacific gave them a negative impression of China. On May 6, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison made it clear that once a war breaks out in the Taiwan Strait, Australia will fulfill its commitment to support the United States and its allies in the Indo-Pacific region. By the way, Australia was the first Western country to stand up to the CCP regarding COVID-19. Last year, Morrison took the lead in calling for an investigation into the origin of the coronavirus, causing the CCP to launch a trade war against Australia. On June 15th last year, the bloodiest conflict in 58 years broke out between China and India on the borders, causing casualties on both sides. 
On June 29th, Voice of America reported that Indian troops deployed on the Sino-Indian border have increased to 200,000, about 40% more than last year. Meanwhile, the CCP had moved troops from Xinjiang into Tibet and increased the deployment of long-range artillery, tanks, rocket regiments, and twin-engine fighters in the border areas. And recently, on July 6, Indian Prime Minister Modi announced on Twitter that he had a phone call with the Dalai Lama to congratulate him on his 86th birthday. The Dalai Lama is despised by the communist regime. Modi's high-profile celebration of the Dalai Lama's birthday reflects the current state of China-India relations. India is high on Xi Jinping's priority list. When the Henan flood disasters made the headlines in July, she didn't go to Henan but instead visited Ningluang, a strategically important town in Tibet near the border of Arunasha Pradesh, which is an area disputed by China and India. She became the first CCP paramount leader to visit the area. During the Cold War, India maintained a neutral position between the United States and the Soviet Union. Before the pandemic, India also tried to remain neutral between China and the U.S. But since the bloody conflict on the border, it has strengthened relations with the United States. In fact, India announced on August the 3rd that it would send four warships into the South China Sea and hold joint military exercises with the United States, Japan, Australia, Britain, and other countries. In December 2018, at the request of the United States, the Canadian government arrested Huawei's CFO, Meng Wanzhou, who is the daughter of Huawei's founder, Ren Zhengfei. Meng is wanted in the U.S. for fraud and violation of U.S. sanctions against Iran. A few days later, the CCP retaliated by arresting two Canadians in China, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, on the grounds of endangering national security. A month later, Canadian Robert Lloyd Schellenberg, who was accused of smuggling drugs, was sentenced to death by a Chinese court. On August the 11th, a CCP court sentenced Michael Spavor to 11 years in prison Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau denounced the sentencing as absolutely unacceptable and unjust. And one day before Spavor's sentencing, the court rejected Schallenberg's appeal of his death sentence. Canada has always been a country with a mild temperament. There's a saying, if you can be friends with the Canadians, you probably won't be friends with anyone. The CCP's rogue behavior is losing friends fast. On the day Michael Spavor was sentenced, dozens of diplomats in China from 25 countries went to the Canadian Embassy in Beijing to show their support, including diplomats from the United States, Japan, Britain, Germany, France, and Lithuania. Speaking of Lithuania, it's a little country with a lot of guts. This small Baltic country with a population of only 3 million was the first former Soviet Union country to declare independence from the USSR, having been oppressed by a communist state and feeling empathy toward Taiwan. Last April, more than 200 Lithuanian political and academic elites sent a letter to President Gitanas Nosida to support Taiwan's entry into international organizations and asked to establish diplomatic ties with Taiwan. On May 22 this year, Lithuania became the first European country to withdraw from CCP's Belt and Road Initiative. Then in the following month, on June 30, the Lithuanian Foreign Minister announced that the country would set up a representative office in Taiwan. On August 10, the CCP protested the Lithuania-Taiwan relations and recalled its ambassador to Lithuania. The regime's mouthpiece, Global Times, suggested that Russia and China team up to punish Lithuania. President Nausida said in an interview that, as a sovereign nation, Lithuania can decide on its own which countries to develop relations with. The CCP wanted to use the Central and Eastern European countries as a gateway to Europe, 
But now it seems that these countries have become the first war against the CCP's encroachment on Europe. Lithuania, Czech Republic, and Slovakia all stood up to China and donated vaccines to Taiwan. Beijing often uses its relations with the European Union as a balance to counter the United States. When the CCP signed the China-EU investment agreement last December, after seven years and 35 rounds of hard negotiations, Xi Jinping's political achievement was touted as a huge victory at a time when Sino-U.S. relations were tense. Experts say that the agreement gained greater strategic significance than economic benefits for China. However, five months later, the European Parliament voted to shelf the China-EU investment agreement. Premier Li Keqiang had a phone conversation with Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi before the vote, trying at the last minute to save the agreement, but it was no use. Three days later, on May 20th, the European Parliament voted 599 in favor, 30 against, and 58 abstentions to freeze the agreement. By the way, Italy was the only G7 member to join the CCP's Belt and Road Initiative, but after being hard hit with the pandemic, the most pro-China G7 member woke up. Italian Foreign Minister said in June that Italy's relations with the United States are much more important than its ties with China. So it's becoming clear that the CCP's foreign policy is hitting a wall everywhere. In deciding its own China policy, every nation is essentially putting a position to consider its future. Each country must use wisdom and courage to make a stand and choose a side. It's not an easy test, but it's one that will have lasting reverberations. In my next video, I will talk about what Beijing and Washington are up to in anticipation of Xi Jinping's big gamble on Taiwan. Stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.